you read those, the Get Out of Zoom app that they have where it's like, it's silly, but it's like that you can make like a baby cry or like the sound of something breaking or Sounds something Sounds good like to that. me. Yeah. So what do you guys do? You're just going to have us run and then you'll edit uh, to make me look uh, better? We'll make you look yeah. great. Yeah. We'll make you look great. We're currently rolling. Oh, oh we're already we're rolling. rolling. Okay, yeah, perfect. Rolling. And we'll let the... Uh, let me, uh, I, I'll, I'll serve water too. You want a cold water? Uh, coffee's fine. Coffee's good. Right, ready? Cool. Ready. Uh, Slate. I only, have, I only have two hands. All right, make sure my phone's on silent. We're all good. Well, let me do the same. I wouldn't want to... Uh, So we're just going to do regular podcast format. Just feel free to speak freely, swear all you want. That's the camera, and that's the camera. So basically, if I want to look into, into the camera, it's that one. Yeah, so this is your camera, and then this will be the wide shot for all three of us. And then this is, this is one's on Emmett, right? Yeah, yeah you and I. You and I, or Keenan. So you can see uh, this program. Yep. That's the one that's current, and the preview is the one that's up at the back. So. Perfect. So do you guys have sponsors and stuff? Not is yet. this paying for itself? Not How yet. long have you been doing it? Uh, we've had a YouTube channel for three years, but we started getting serious on it um, last summer. We started getting like actually being consistent, and because before it was just kind of like a catch-all, and then we were like, you know what? Let's yep. put a little more time into we'll it. Uh, focus on the format a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. All right, do your all thing. Right. Wait, let me do this. All right, slate it up, buddy. I got the. I think we got the slate. Yeah, we you got good. Okay, oh, we cool. already got yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to the Unfazed Review Podcast. I'm Ben. And I'm Emmett. And today we are with Derek Foster of Meat Puppets fame. I'm Derek. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you for joining us, sir. Appreciate it's my pleasure. It. Yeah, this is awesome. So I guess uh, the appropriate way to start would be take us back to the beginning of your musical roots, because I know you're a, you're a Phoenix guy, but were you, were you born here? Were you? I was born in Phoenix in 1960. Nice, um, nice. Happy, happy almost birthday, by the way. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Actually, today is a, is the birthday of the band's very first uh, record. The, wow. The, the no seven-inch EP. No way. Yeah, wow. That has been a car in it, and that was apparently released today that in 1981. That is amazing. Dang. All right. Cool. That is, serendipitous. That's, that's, yeah, very serendipitous. Folks like to pretend that that's not actually the Meat Puppets, that we found our, our, our way later on, but honestly, I think that's a great record. It's one of our... One of my favorites. Uh, That's awesome. Of course, you know you, you you might not notice it if you're you know keyed into us later, but uh, I think it's all there. So. That's awesome. Um, as far as uh, Phoenix goes, I was born here. My folks, you know, lived here for several you know, years. Their family moved here, and uh, I was born up at St. Joseph Hospital down on uh, where with Doug McDowell, I guess. And uh, mm. my uh, folks were going to ASU, and my my dad was a was studying to be a teacher. My mom was uh, putting him through school, and then uh, they f- split up in about 1967. And I moved to Paradise Valley the following year when my mom remarried. That uh, took me through, uh, um, you know, we lived in Paradise Valley till about 1980. Uh, in 1974, I finally got access to grass, grew my hair out. Um, had the high school uh, lifestyle that you want. Uh, in fact, I went to high school just right up the street here at uh, uh, Chaparral. Oh, oh, great. Nice. I, I, great. I, I don't want to be creepy and let you guys uh, tell your audience where uh, your studio is. But I went to Swara. We're, we're sworn enemies. Yeah, no. Well, <laughs> they're going to duke it out later. <laughs> well, back then we had a, like a, an open, um, open uh, district, and I could go wherever right. I wanted. And the friends of mine, uh, I lived kind of on the you know, on the edge of Paradise Valley, and a lot of my friends went there, us uh, upper middle class kids. So for I, sure, I went there. I had to hitchhike to school uh, for the first year. Wow. It was not close. There were no buses, oh, wow. and eventually, I had to like literally climb the tail of Mummy Mountain to get to the closest bus stop. Wow! So I used to um, wake up, throw on my boots, and run out the door to try to hit the uh, the bus. Uh, well, anyway, good for you. In 1977. Um, Cream Magazine started having these little small articles about uh, punk rock and bands called the Sex Pistols. And uh, I was like, well, I like this Johnny Rotten guy. He, he tells it like it is, man. Yeah. And I uh, got more and more interested. And then um, bands in, in Phoenix, punk rock bands in Phoenix, like uh, Liars, Exterminators, Consumers uh, started coming out. And it turns out we knew these guys because they were... Um, they were selling us the good bud in high school. Oh, okay. and they were all uh, older and they were into bands and, you know, turned us on to bands like, you know, King Crimson and stuff like that. And then they 
flipped the switch and started getting into uh, the dam, the sex pistols, the germs and whatnot. Nice. One, of, one of them ended up joining the germs. Oh, cool. And uh, I was hooked. I uh, really, really dug these bands. Couldn't go see them because they were playing, uh, you know, in, cl- in bars and I was too young. Yeah. But I got to know some of them um, since I couldn't see their shows. And then, you know, I went to, to college and they moved to L.A., a lot of them. And uh, when I got back... Um, I really wanted to start a band. I really wanted to be a punk rocker. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, went through all of my friends, and um, you know, most of them are real into the new CSNY and the, the new Grateful Dead album, and uh, we used to get into fights over that, and eventually... Because you wanted to be the punk route. Yeah, because I, was, yeah. I wasn't into them anymore. And then I, I met uh, Kurt. I had known him for a while, because again, he suck- seeked my friends out mm-hmm. because we were getting the good bud from gotcha. the, the local punk rockers. <laughs> gotcha. You guys so, are going to school together, right? No, he w- they lit, went to Sunny Slope High and okay. Brophy Prep. I okay. think um, Kurt got kicked out of Brophy Prep and went started going to Sunny Slope. Maybe they both got kicked out. I can't remember. Okay. The social but, network revolves around the good bud. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, so that's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, the thing is, is between... Between my house and the Tower Records on 19th Ave, mm-hmm. Kurt's house was right in between. So oh, cool. a lot of times I would swing by after uh, uh, buying stuff at Tower Records, and I'd show him what I'd gotten, and he'd be, like, getting kind of interested. And I was like, huh, this guy uh, doesn't seem to hate the punk rock. Yeah. And, of course, he was... Uh, the first time I, I met him, he mm-hmm. had just gotten a Jeep, and um, he took us off-roading in it. And he dro- w- rode that Jeep like a, a bucking Bronco. Yeah. And he was like into motorcycle racing until he got into an accident and uh, needed to like stop that. Started playing yeah. guitar. But uh, it was obvious right away he was particularly feral. And, uh, you know, uh, he was a real interesting character. You feel like that would translate into the music kind of? Well, the thing is, is like I did one semester and or two semesters in college in Tucson mm-hmm. and then I quit and uh, he and I were the only people who weren't doing shit so uh, he was dri- driving a school bus in the mornings and the afternoon and then was avoiding his mom's house in between because things were uh, were somewhat tense there because mm-hmm. he wasn't doing shit right yeah. and uh, my family didn't really care what I did my mom was uh, breaking up her second marriage and we were kind of uh, being left to ourselves, and uh, he used to show up at my house uh, with the good bud, nice. and uh, we would, um, you know, kill time till he had to go and, and uh, drive the, the afternoon school bus. And he had uh, remarked to me uh, w- one day that he had seen Iggy Pop uh, at the, uh, the down in Tempe, wow. and Iggy Pop was touring with uh, this would have been nineteen seventy nine, and he was touring with Brian James, who was the original. Uh, guitarist for the damned oh wow, okay. and i didn't see that show um iggy pop i wasn't i wasn't really into the old school guys trying to like make good on the punk rock scene i wanted to i was at this point i was really into like you know x the germs the alley cats the bands that were coming up in in the la and i just you know just read about them got their records and never saw them what Couldn't, was your uh, uh your f- very first concert that you went to a uh, punk rock or in general in general um, uh, George Carlin with Kenny Rankin open for him Very in probably cool. 1974. <laughs> was that, that a cool. celebrity theater? Yeah. Was that the, I, that's cool. I think my dad was at that show. <laughs> no. Um, I liked, you know, comedy. I, in fact, I, comedy. I did not like music, uh, when I was growing up. I would change the channel if, uh, if the comedian went off in the band. Oh, went, wow. went. Okay. So I never was into <laughs> music, but I got into music when I heard about punk rock because I was like, <clears throat> I like this you know, attitude. Yeah. Uh, so what was the first punk show, though? Uh, well, the first punk... Uh, op- first of all, like I said, we couldn't go and see the the local bands. Mm-hmm. Um, Just because of the bars? Because of the bars. So I had complained in... Because the journalist Bart Bull was writing about uh, on, on in the New Times saying, if you're not going to see these bands, um, uh, you're, you ain't shit. I was like, well, fuck you. I can't even go. So why don't you guys do some all-ages shows? So the, uh, the, co- the singer from The Consumers, David Wiley, uh, contacted me and invited me over to the house where I got to see The Liars perform, and that was <coughs> um, Don Bowles and 
uh, who later joined the Germs, and uh, John Precious, who was in like Killer Pussy and half the other bands in town. And, and he was on guitar, even though he was predominantly a drummer. And then um, their friend, um, Dale Smith, who is on drums. Uh, John and Dale are, are both gone now, and Don is, is still hanging in there. Mm. Uh, Were you familiar with um, Billy Clone and the Same? Yeah, see, that was not it. Yeah. <laughs> Them and the Blue Shoes were the bands that we were, like, opposed to. Mm. They were, like, new wave bands. Okay. I'm talking about fucking punk rock bands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a little more edge. Uh, a lot more edge yeah. <laughs> than, uh, than certainly the Blue Shoes and Billy Clone. Those were um, bands that were considered to be more or less careering. They okay. were plugging into like the regular circuit, whereas mm -hmm. the punk rock bands, if they got shows at all, there would be a fight. Wow. Okay. And the audience would like um, would fight them. Uh, so they weren't they weren't necessarily careering per se. Yeah, uh, they were looking. They were trying to create new avenues. Now uh, the consumers opened for a showing of uh, the then current uh, uh, Desperate Living by John Waters, his uh, okay. third feature. So I got to see them then, and they also did an all age show down on uh, I think it was, a, it was a bar. I think it was called the Zoo at the time, hmm. and um, I got to see them then. But the first. Um, you know, international act I saw was when the jam opened for Bebop Deluxe oh, at the nice. Celebrity Theater. Nice. And um, the audience booed, and there was about, you know, a dozen punks in the audience, and mm -hmm. I was still young. I didn't really know these guys then, and uh, they uh, there was a lot of punk rockers that were trying to slam and trying to pogo to show their, show their support for the band. I remember the jam people like going, you guys all suck except for these guys down here. <laughs> and they got thrown out. Oh, uh, yeah. And then later they hung out with the band. That's uh, cool. So yeah. I saw the jam in 1977. That's very cool. And, um, so was that a common thing? Like people booing the opening acts? Or was it just because of the punk vibe, you think? No, it was the punk thing. Yeah. No, the, the punk rock was not, not accepted in 1977. Uh, yeah. by your, I mean, I'd, I just... You know, those questions uh, indicate to me that you just have no idea how square the audiences were yeah. in the mid-70s. Well, it's just crazy because growing up, it's always like punk was just so accepted and, you know, almost streamlined. But back then, it was different. No. You know? yeah, I think the point of punk in the beginning, at least, was to go against what was yeah. generally accepted. Well, yeah. Phoenix had a lot of good, uh, had, a, had a good... Uh, kind of archaic, or, I mean, anarchic kind of attitude. Mm. Um, you know, you, you have your Alice Cooper, who was like, um, you know, doing art rock for, you know, uh, looted out teenagers, you yeah. know, uh, you know, hanging himself on stage. And he used to wave a, a clock, a, a watch in front of the audience, try to hypnotize the audience. <laughs> and since they were all on lewds, it worked a lot. <laughs> yeah. So they were definitely like, well, we got to do hits so we can stay in business. But then the show would be really fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, the Tubes were a were you know a joining of two different bands, the Beans, and uh, and then they joined with another group called the, I believe it was the Red White and Blues Band. Okay. And the Beans were like a performance art group that was theatrical, and whereas the other one was kind of like a, a rock band, and they combined to do a very theatrical um, kind of a thing. So already you've got bands in Phoenix that are doing something that is a little bit unique not just playing uh, bar band stuff. Yeah. So uh, a lot of, of uh, a, a lot of your, your your guys are coming up were doing something that was a little bit on the edge of performance art anyway, and then punk rock was like, oh yeah. So there was a confrontation with the straight bar audiences, and um, David Wiley uh, used to get beat up by uh, the cowgirls in the, in the audience. <laughs> and... Uh, Anyway, they moved to uh, California, the consumers did, promptly broke up. David uh, joined a band called The Human Hands, and I stayed in touch with them. And the Meat Puppets uh, got together after Curtin and I had started. Basically, he had seen Iggy Pop and Brian James. It was like, well, here's Raw Power. Here's the first Damned album. Go home, learn some of these songs, and we'll jam on them. And um, it took Kurt maybe one listen to figure out these but simple songs. Yeah. And I had a drum kit. I'd been playing drums with another guy who was not interested in... I browbeat him into forming a kind of a semi-punk punk pop band. Uh -huh. But he uh, he wanted to go to school. The, the, the pressure was on him to, like, 
you know, make good on his uh, parents' investment. Yeah. So he was out of the picture, and I got tired of uh, of dealing with his intransigence. And uh, so I went whole hog with Kurt. He brought his brother in, and his brother was um, a misanthropic person about my age. He was still overweight. I had been overweight till about puberty, and I had lost it. He, uh, when I first met him, was still... Uh, overweight, but eventually he and his brother took a trip down the Yukon, and Chris learned the uh, the technique which he used to use on tour of starving himself until <laughs> he weighed nothing, and then uh, so he was all fit and ready to reinvent himself as a, as a bass player, <laughs> no longer hiding uh, his his shame, just like I did when I was uh, a preteen. Both of us were like reinventing ourselves as rockers. That's cool. And uh, we formed this feral little outfit, and those guys were like definitely into um, uh, the the Dynesian elements. The uh, the the like, let's take these simple songs and play them just as hard as we can. That's cool. And it's not like hard fast rules. It's not like hardcore, and it wasn't really like punk rock. It was kind of like a updating of the the, the music that we liked, which of course was. Can Frank Zappa, um, those guys were really into bands like uh, Ralph Towner, John Abercrombie, who were like on the ECM label. They were doing kind of electric jazz, mm -hmm. uh, kind of post Mahavishnu. Definitely Mahavishnu was in there. I didn't know from any of that stuff. I just wanted to play uh, crazy shit, and my uh, enthusiasm was able to put me over despite my lack of chops because I was only interested in playing punk rock. Were you were you self taught or did you? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, uh, I un mistaught myself. I uh, I started playing matched grip because I didn't know any better. I never bothered to learn like the correct handling of sticks or the correct rudiments or anything. So I, you know, crippled myself from day one to play <laughs> a very unique style. Okay. But um, we put it over and put it over hard, and we had a good uh, persona that was. Um, you know, just crazy, you know. And so when we first started doing shows, people were like, who are these? And it's like, are they gay? Are they bikers? You know, nope, we weren't part of the scene. We yeah. just came out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah, the one thing that comes to mind when I listen to a lot of your guys' early stuff, and I like that you said right out of the gate, I think you guys knew what you wanted to go for, is that you're, you're, you're very genuine. I think a lot of bands at the time, they were trying to go for some kind of theme or some kind of yeah. image they were cultivating. Oh, yeah. but you guys just, you did exactly what you wanted to do. Well, I think everybody wanted to explore the new options. Yeah. And everybody, and that's part of the, the, the ethic, is like, well, we're going to take what we have mm -hmm. and put forth on it. Um, in my particular case, I have, um, I have a, a, a very wide, deep and uh, excellent vision I'm a, a pr profoundly uh, uh, profound artist. I know exactly what I want and was able to uh, convince those guys of it. And um, eventually, awesome. eventually, uh, Kurt, um, you know, I was like, Kurt, here's some lyrics, throw a, a riff onto it, and we've got some songs. So we wrote a handful of songs like that. Yeah. Yeah. And at the beginning, it was like, you know, me, uh, just in a lot of those punk rock songs are pretty stupid. Some of the lyrics are like, you know, it's supposed to be a, a parody of, of punk rock and a parody of, like, um, you know, uh, anthems and stuff like that. Very stupid. Thank God Kurt uh, never bothered to really learn the words and just kind of screamed and groaned over them so nobody ever has to know how bad my lyrics were. <laughs> over them. But he got, you know, eventually he got doing it himself and didn't right. need me to uh, to assist. Yeah. And the, the really great songs from the, even the early period are, like, his, his thing, songs like, H. Eleanor, uh, um, Dolphin Field, Big House uh, are just like, they really hold up. They're uh, very interesting uh, lyrics, good songs. And then the first album um, is still mostly him and I. Uh, and then by the second album, obviously, he was like, started to mine his own interests, uh, his, his country influences, his um, more classic rock influences. And Meat Puppets 2 was a whole different bag to the point where nobody cares about our early punk rock stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you can just cut all of this part of the show out because nobody really cares. <laughs> I don't know if the camera <laughs> caught it, but uh, you were saying today was the anniversary of the yeah. EP, the first EP. Right. Yeah. 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 Apparently, uh, well, according to somebody who... Uh, Are we good on this mic, Max? Yeah. Was okay. on... Uh, cool. cool, cool, thanks. 
according to somebody who is on uh, Instagram, they were like, "Today is the fortieth anniversary." I'm like, "Well, I remember the f- the first week in June is when it came out." Yeah, uh, we had um, we had hooked up with uh, some friends of David Wiley's. Uh, he got us our first show was in, oh, okay. in California. Cool, and uh, they got our first show in in Tucson, the, the Meat Puppets, and it was uh, there was one club that was doing that was playing had like a punk rock night, and there was punk rock bands in Tucson as well. In fact. Uh, when I went to Tucson, when I went to school for a year, I had been playing uh, with my friend, and we had a little band called the Atomic Bomb Club. And through that, we met some other, uh, some of the other Tucson people. So we got to, I got to know some of them, and so we got a gig in Tucson. And it was uh, what what I discovered was you can rehearse all you want, mm-hmm. you can get as tight as you want, but when you get on stage in front of people, it's a whole other thing. Yeah. And suddenly our songs were like. Five times as fast, mm. completely unintelligible, played so hard, and it's like, I still have a real distorted recording of that first show, and it's just <laughs> like, oh, wow, what cool. the, it's on, it's on um, Live Music Archive somewhere. Oh, great. Awesome. But That's it's good. just like, so it's, it's out there. it sounded nothing like what we'd been rehearsing. Yeah. It yeah. was just like over the top crazy. Yeah, so. I wanted to ask you about that, because I remember in a, in a separate interview, you, you mentioned how you really like when you sort of break free and start to compose on the spot. Oh, yeah. And so how does that generally come about? Do you sort of do it in a jazz way where you like play and then you delegate a certain instrument for a certain uh, solo or do you just kind of just go with the flow? And My understanding of jazz is that it's actually fairly um, musical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, our uh, preform improvisations usually took the form of kind of more... Um, no, noise oriented you know almost kraut rock, kraut rocky okay because uh, like i said we were really into can and of course can did their composition by jamming in the studio and then yeah. cutting the tapes up and until they came up with stuff uh, hmm. so a lot of it was just very free form we were you know so ne- we had never really fallen too far from the grateful dead tree mm. and uh so we understood space and understood um that level of, uh, of uh, free improvisation. And obviously there's free improv in, in jazz. Um, you know, I, I, I love the, the, the post um, 68, 69 Miles Davis stuff yeah. from the early 70s. The, uh, so it was pretty natural. That's great. It'd be like we would, uh, in fact, the first improv we did basically came about because there was a, particularly aggressive and fucked up guy in the audience in the Tucson show who threw a beer bottle through my bass drum. And so we were like, well, let's just play some noise for the rest of the show. <laughs> Ken Lefebvre. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, we were kind of sticking close to what we were going for, songs and whatnot. We didn't really get into jamming on, on stage until later. And it's hard to say where, where that came from. But um, we took a lot of acid too. Yeah, <laughs> and also I think the the longer you play for, the more you just understand each other, and oh, yeah. the more you're able to just do and, that. But that was our, our focus. Right. You know? right. It wasn't yeah. like I don't know what other bands are, are going for. I think yeah. at the end of the day, most bands are basically looking to make it pay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that didn't really. I never had any. Uh, I never had any doubt that we were the greatest. I always I was like listen to us going. This is you know I, I, this is gonna save the fucking planet. This is yeah. the coolest sound i've ever heard you're confident right out of the gate just oh yeah. Yeah, yeah oh yeah i mean wouldn't you be if you had uh kurt kirkwood and Derek <laughs> bostrom in the same band hell yeah just saying <laughs> anyway uh people liked it so yeah. we were getting shows and uh i s- sent a recording of some of the stuff to david wiley in la he got us some shows out there and then um we met the band monitor mm. uh, another kind of psychedelic um um band not not wild jammy stuff more of your kind of atmospheric proto cocktail uh kind of band and their album is like is is still available or it's been reissued and it's a terrific record yeah. um and they were uh definitely in the uh in the art rock kind of post art rock thing uh they were close friends with boyd rice somebody we also got to know mm-hmm. another noise artist that we mm-hmm. related to heavily so you you could say that getting involved with which is what's basically was the called the Los Angeles Free Music Society. Uh, we got involved with that group and it definitely helped encourage us to not be hardcore. <laughs> so by the time we finally 
fell into the SST pit of, of hardcore. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had already been well enough developed to where we were um, at odds with them right off the bat. Right. So we were already, I mean, the first thing that we did with SST was, uh, you know, we already had long hair and were wearing overalls and they were already like, Ugh. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we were, uh, we did our, our first uh, record with Monitor. They uh, wanted us to perform their song Hair for them on their album because it was a hard and fast kind of a punk pastiche, which they felt we could do better. They figured, we're setting up to record our album. We're going to have the Meat Puppets come in and record our song. And while we're there, well, we'll, ha- we'll record five of our own, and then they'll like bankroll our, the EP for yeah. us, which mm-hmm. is the one that came out 40 years ago today. That's awesome. And we went into three pressings with it, got good results. Um, in the meantime, they were doing another side project with Joe Carducci and his partner, uh, John Bouchard, for their record label or their distribution label, Systematic. And I guess the label was Thermidor. Hmm. And Joe was like, I want to do a record with the Me Puppets too. And we're like, bring it on. And then Joe went to work with, uh, with SST. So he said, well, it's going to be our record, but we'll have SST pay for it and cool. it'll be on their label. It'll be a joint release. I'm like, just bring it on. I don't care. Yeah. Point me to the studio. And then we fell into the SST thing and did several records with them. That one being our last one. Very cool. Um, SST was uh, groundbreaking in getting show, you know, getting a, 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 a situation where bands could tour all over the country, provided right. they didn't mind um, playing for nothing, which we did. Uh, and, I, and I missed it. I'm sorry. Did you record predominantly in Phoenix or L.A. for we, those we early reco- albums? We recorded um, the first album, uh, the first EP with Monitor in Silver Lake okay. with Ed Barger, uh, who uh, worked with Devo uh, oh, cool. um, Engineering. And we did the first album uh, when SST was working with Unicorn. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, you guys are familiar with the whole uh, screw up that they had with Uniform, Unicorn Records. They did the, the, the Damaged album. It got, um, Unicorn had a distribution deal with MCA who refused to do the record because it was anti-parent. Okay. Mm, yeah. And um, so that kind of threw Unicorn into a uh, bit of a, financial problem which they probably had anyway yeah. it, you know hurt their relationship with their just distrib- with mca their partner and uh, by the time we came around uh we were trying to figure out how to record in the studio we uh we got a really bad sound for that first album and it was mixed and mixed <coughs> and remixed and remixed and remixed and the monitor guys started um you know taking studio time which they didn't really have authorized yeah. to remix it and the next thing you know, they told us that they had stolen the tapes from SST because they didn't <laughs> want to work with SST <laughs> oh, and they wanted to release the record themselves. But the mixes they were doing and the things they were telling us were things like, we are going to market you guys as a country and western band. We're going to push oh. Tumbling Tumbleweeds to country radio. And we're like... Oh. We're trying to like package you. <laughs> well, we just... Things were just... We were just being very passive. And yeah. The, and then finally Spot said, well, let me check check out the mixes I did. Mm-hmm. And we were like, yeah, we're going with Spot's mixes. They're cool. the ones that are the closest to what we had in mind. And uh, so we... It is the... I'm sorry to interrupt you. The 40th anniversary of that first EP. Mm-hmm. You thinking about doing any kind of uh, reissue or anything like that? Or like a record store day exclusive or anything like that? No. No? Don't interrupt me again. I'm no, actually, <laughs> actually um, we are... You know, we've had the the... We, we did the reissues of all the SST records on Ryko disc. Um, I put those together while the band was in interim. And those are still more or less the, the records you can still get, although okay. they've been re-released through another company and are probably going to get re-released again next year, the year before, cool. year after. So we're probably going to reissue the, the Ryko disc ones, which were kind of done when the band was kind of finished. So it's almost a post-mortem. Okay. Um, Plus, it's very 1999. Okay. So it's got like a. The original ones had a, a one of those data partitions, so you could put the CD in your computer and watch a little postage stamp size video. Mm. And uh, those aren't on there anymore, but the credits are still on the mm. record. So yeah. I'm hoping okay. to get those credits removed. Okay. Because uh, yeah, I saw you really took charge, especially during that first hiatus of really taking over in terms of like. The, uh, you know all your all your music and everything with the meat puppets like you well, really I had a lot of this the stuff I always wanted to release these bonus tracks and we've got some other pro- for 
for record store day right now, um, we uh, we're doing this Mud Honey uh, uh, Meat Puppets, uh, you know, dual seven oh, inch. Very cool, very cool. And that's uh, each of us do a cover. That's awesome. nice. And nice. that's you know coming out. I guess June twelfth or June twenty fourth. Twenty first. I think it's June. It's either the twenty first or the twelfth. Okay. I don't remember yeah. which. I don't <laughs> remember honest, which day record store day is this yeah. year. But that's coming out, and obviously Very that's cool. an exclusive, and it's vinyl. Very and cool. no fans are not releasing it on CD. Sorry, buy a, buy a record player, or don't. That's awesome. Um, that's awesome. We did a record for record store day last year, which of course was a clusterfuck. Also, uh, uh, well, record store day was first. Canceled, then uh, oh, yeah, yeah. postponed, and then split up into three different days. Gotcha. And of course, the the fans are like, I guess it's like you know, in the interim between 1995 when we stopped and 2017 when I restarted, y'all fans have become a real pain in the ass. Yeah. It's like you you post something on your Facebook page saying this record's coming out or we're doing this show, and they're like, oh, it's not good enough. <laughs> okay. I want two records, and I want you to play in my backyard. Jeez. I was like, yeah, but that's not what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. People get weird. It's almost like... Well, they think it's a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And they think they, like, own the music in a way. And in a way, you know, it's like they they make it a part of their life. You yeah, they know? think they, you owe them something. Yeah. I like, barely yeah. think that this is a conversation here. <laughs> that hurts, man. So, <laughs> that hurts. But, but, you know, the thing is, is uh, definitely your rock music came up as a means of communication about culture as a way of getting pe- giving people a new identity, both for white folks and not so white folks. So I understand why people cleave to music as like an I- a identity thing. Yeah. But, you know, uh, we got bigger fish to fry yeah. than fighting over what, what uh, town uh, I'm playing in next month. Yeah. Uh, we got some real problems here. And the, 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 the best thing the Meat Puppets can teach you anything is that a Turn off your mind, relax, float stream, whatever you have, yeah. float downstream, whatever you have it. Um, the meat puppets are only good when uh, we're all not thinking about it together. And uh, anyway, um, we recorded Meat Puppets 2 and um, Up on the Sun, the follow up, the two records that people like that we did in LA. Mm. And then, but Meat Puppets 2 took, um, I think we recorded it and, and then. SST could didn't get around to mixing it for like eight months, oh, damn. and in the meantime, the Minutemen and the Husker Du's put out their land break land l- groundbreaking <laughs> post punk, you know, embrace of the past mainstream whatever records, and we're like, dude, we we did this record like yeah at the beginning of the year. Why That's don't you tough. release it? It's like, yeah. do you guys not like our country punk? <laughs> and then s- and other bands are like going. We've discovered country punk, and we're like, oh, "Could God. we get this record out, please?" Yeah. <laughs> That's annoying. Yeah, yeah, it was real annoying, and we felt like we didn't have any control over what we were doing, and we started to wonder, "Well, maybe we should have gone with the Monitor guys yeah. instead. Maybe they weren't so wrong about these fuckers." Mm-hmm. Anyway, we get the the Meat Puppets two record out, and we're on tour with Black Flag, and cool. That's badass. And and uh, it gets a four star review in Rolling Stone while we're on the mi- in the middle of the road. Black Flag guys were like, they were almost okay with that. I mean, I'm sure they would be happy to sell records, but at the end of the day, SST was about Black Flag first. Yeah. And it was a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> and so the next time we had to do a record, we are like, all right, how are we going to maintain control of this? So we, you know, uh, practiced the hell out of the record, and then we conceived of Up on the Sun as something we could get done in three days. We got three days of lockout. Oh, wow. Recorded the whole thing, mixed it, edited it, presented it to them. Done. Wow. Get it out. Did well. So do you kind of prefer that? Just kind of the rapid fire recording? Um, or do you like a little more really, time to kind of? Really. Yeah. Um, I mean, we re- we rehearsed a lot on it. Okay. We actually had um, we our original thought was to record it in town on our own, and we had uh, rented this weird quarter inch eight track machine. Okay. And tried to record a bunch of stuff in our engineers house and got about a third of the way through before the uh the 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 music store uh sold the thing out from under us and we had to cancel our lease wow and it was just as well because the sounds weren't real good really and uh and it was kind of a sprawling psychedelic kind of a work and we was like well we need to rearrange these so that for three piece to do fast something yeah. we could do live yeah and so um 
we did up in the sun, kind of a live thing, and still it wasn't good enough because they're like going, because on stage, even though we put out this nice record, we were still doing a lot of Elvis and ZZ Top covers, okay. and um, people are like, these guys aren't very good on stage, and the singing really sucks. Hmm. So we were like, God, you can't win for losing with these fuckers. Yeah, and so. You know, we took another step back. We started recording in Phoenix, um, started doing stuff that was a little bit more, I don't I wouldn't say commercial, but a little less punk rock. So you've got like Out My Way, um, Mirage, Huevos, yeah. uh, and then this one, which is clearly our Love and Rockets, or Love and Rockets. Um, what's that other band with uh, that crazy uh, red-headed fucker on, the, uh, <laughs> on, on vocals? Oh man, um, you know everybody's Guns and Roses. Oh, oh Guns yeah. and Roses. <laughs> that's that's yeah. our, our Guns and Roses uh, fake uh, <laughs> heavy metal big hair album, yeah. and um, you know managed to get us uh, signed. In the meantime, um, the major labels were coming in and uh, signing everything that that uh, that stood on two legs. Mm-hmm. We had tried to get signed in '86, and we were told that uh, um, we just didn't. We just weren't as good as um, I don't know what boys two men. I don't even know oh, what. God. It was just like, you know, we didn't have the look, and so uh, right. <laughs> they couldn't. They didn't. They didn't figure out how to sell us. Yeah, yeah. So we had to stick with SST. But we had tried to get signed before. In the meantime, um, who's coming up? Chili Peppers, um, Jane's Addiction. They're starting to get some some interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, bands like Love and Rockets uh, were doing well, and uh, there was a greater interest in alternative music Mm -hmm. but what that meant to the sst uh, was that the 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 bands who's could do and miniman were were, well miniman would have gotten signed um who's could do got signed replacements got signed all of these bands who were propping up the independent distribution wing um got taken out of our stream and suddenly um because what you basically do is now you you, you, you say, all right, we got the new Meat Puppets coming out, and we'll give you this, but uh, you got to take the other our other ten releases, which aren't going to sell. Right. <laughs> so yes. without the the uh, tent pole releases, there was nothing selling. And next thing you know, our distributors, our, our SST distributors, are starting to bail and go out of business and owe them money, and um, you can't find our records in the store. So like we're going we're going around the the country. And you can't find this in the stores, but you can find our opening band, who's on uh, Atlantic, and That's they've crazy. got all these Atlantic people coming backstage, blowing smoke up their asses, and we're literally hand painting our own fucking T-shirts to sell Damn. to like pay for gas. Yeah, Damn. and we're like, and you know, Curse is like, I'm gonna quit. I can't do this anymore. I was like, well, uh, maybe we tried to get signed again. Did you guys also do your own art for the albums? Yes. Very cool. I put together. I put together all the album covers based on the band's art cool um so like that's a drawing of kurtz and then the inside is a god god awful collage of all the various art and uh, pictures that we put together um actually, so we, we i was gonna say actually if you want to look at this album you gotta take it out of plastic it's gonna reflect on the camera oh it's true, true. now here's the thing with this one i actually have a note in here I wanted you to take a look at. Yeah, that's me. 1989. That is me. That might bring back some memories. And then I also made a copy for you as well, if you want to hang on to it. I put that... uh, Ladies and gentlemen, in um, 19... See, this is the tour. um, God. Where uh, we would have bands uh, opening for us that were signed. Our 1989 uh, fall tour, where we played on... um, uh, November 18th in Boulder, Colorado at the Glenn Miller Ballroom. Wow. You all remember Glenn Miller, don't you? Of course. Yes. Well, not really. <laughs> we don't remember. I didn't know anything about it. We know. Really? <laughs> well, Glenn Miller sing, sing, sing. Um, was a... Oh, yeah, yeah. Glenn, Glenn Miller was uh, it c- came up in the swing movement. He pioneered a sound that was clarinet-based. Right. Um, so his stuff is very sweet. It's not as much trombone trumpet and um and saxophone so he had a lot of clarinets yeah um he got a lot of hits that were real mainstream real middle of the road not very uh jazzy um and apparently he was a real martinet a real pain in the ass to work for yeah um and then he uh 
his he was he joined the uh, the 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 World War II effort, and his plane was lost over the uh, the English Channel in 1944. Yeah, wow. during the uh, Battle of the Bulge period. Hmm. Anyway, um, they named a ballroom after him, <laughs> and we played there on uh, the 18th of uh, November in 1989. And I would be happy to take that co a copy of that. Yeah, in yeah. fact, is that your copy, my friend? This is. Where's your pen? Oh, you this need is a second signature on this. This is exa actually exactly what I wanted. I would love right. you to sign the album. All right. I would be anywhere you'd like to sign. Well, I'm not going to sign it on the plastic. You want me to sign it? I got it. Rip it open. Sign Rip these. it open, man. I'll just sign this. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Exactly why I brought the Sharpie. There you go. You rock. That's what I used to look like. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And then we got a copy of that for you as well. Yeah, which I would be happy to yeah. take. Do you, do you remember some uh, specifics about this? Like this tour? Yeah, yeah, because it's like, an, I saw, you know, the little note you put on there, but it's like, what else do you remember about it, you know? Can you believe I would send you this illegible crap and you're expected to read it? <laughs> um, here is the promised record. I hope you enjoy our input as much as your own, the photos, that is. Where did you get this? Did you get this on eBay it, or something? No, no, no. It, it was just in the album. I bought the album at Zia, and it was in the album. Wow. So I'm assuming whoever got this... Huh. Yeah. So it was in 1989. Oh, and, you should uh, give me the original. No. You can have the original um, if you no, want. No, no. Uh, thing is, is <laughs> somebody... This was given to someone who uh, took a photo. But his is provenance. Whoever got this... Uh, took the f took one of the photos on the inside. Oh. Okay. Now, if you look at the credits, you'll see that we kind of pay it play. Well, they're inside. Um, oh, I they, here. If it's a, it's a collage of other people's work, and we played as a little bit fast and loose with the uh, okay with with the credits. Um, photos by Ian Harper. Yeah. Rainy Kane. Um, Janet um, is definitely would definitely live in town, but I wouldn't have written her such a formal letter because okay. we were friends. Okay. Uh, yeah, but literally that one was a surprise. Like I bought this album and I was like, "What do we have here?" It's freaking awesome. Yeah, isn't that cool? Uh, oh, oh, I can see. I'm mentioning uh, that there was the um, the uh, the 1989 earthquake in San Francisco, and I talk about how they had to postpone the World Series. Oh, so, yeah, wow. Anyway, isn't that um, wild? That's a trip, though. It's like little that's, little, that's little time nice. capsule. If, if the band were actually popular, that might be worth something. <laughs> Instead, you can just hang on to that for yourself. Pretty cool, though. Makes me happy. Um. So anyway, we finally did get signed, and uh, we were going to go to at, go with Atlantic, but the fella that uh, we were working with in Atlantic decided to quit the music business and go to his home in Azerbaijan to uh, to help his country out in the uh, wake of the collapse of the, of the uh, Soviet Union. Okay. Uh, and we wound up working with his boss, who was like, well... Yeah, I still want you guys, but I'm going to go... I'm trying to parlay... A, uh, apparently there were some uh, issues with in Atlantic. Uh, I believe that come, I come to find out that the fellow who wound up um, managing Nirvana, um, who just put about put a book about uh, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Cobain out a couple years back. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, he came into Atlanta. I guess they didn't. Him, my uh, our our benefactor wanted to bail, so he got a job uh, running uh, London, which was. Uh, a imprint for uh, for another label. Crap, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but London obviously is what like ZZ Top put out their early records in the seventies, and so they just re you know brought this label back, <clears throat> signed us to London. We did Forbidden Places, uh, which was uh, our first experience having to work with an outside producer, which was basically forced on us, and it started our relationship with um, Pete Anderson, who of course. Uh, Played guitar and uh, produced um, Dwight Yoakam. Very cool. And uh, and uh, that record was a kind of countryish. <clears throat> and about the time they came out, Nirvana broke, and so our record sank without a trace because it was like heading in the wrong direction. But for the next record, they're like, "You guys are going grunge this time," and we're like, "Okay, whatever you want to call it." And we well, were it's so funny because you influenced so many of those bands, like you influenced Nirvana and Soundgarden and. If you say so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you did. Uh, and you can hear it, in some, especially like this album here. I was like, I was listening to this this morning, and it's just like, you hear, you hear elements that those other guys picked up on. Well, we were kind of trying to like play to that audience for this yeah. piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 we were lucky that, uh, and we were like, 
they were going to for- force various producers on us. We'd have to have demo sessions with these producers, and they didn't like it. And finally, Paul Leary steps in going, I'll produce y'all a record. And we're like, thank God. Yeah. And yeah. they were like, cool, butthole surfers, that works. And um, we did this nice record with them, uh, with him, which uh, did well. And it's one of those deals where, like, well, you're either going to, like, you're either going to, like, pay to make this record go. Or you're going to have to fall on your swords because you signed a, uh, a turkey. So they managed to, to pay uh, um, too, uh, too high to die into the, into the, the uh, you know, popularity. We got yeah. ourselves a gold record. Yeah, and cool. uh, then, of course, um, that could not be repeated. Uh, and, you know, God bless 1994. That's uh, what we called uh, the beginning of our lost period. When it was like we were working for the man. We had... Uh, forgotten why we were doing it we were playing constantly uh we took a, a one plane trip a week on the average in 1994 clocked wow. tons of miles and oh boy if you ever wonder what a marginal band what it takes for a marginal band to get a hit it's called um going into hawk to your record label because <laughs> they bored boy did they ever spend money to get that record over that we never recouped Damn. wow and uh then you know, uh, no joke came out. The, the the bloom was off the rose. Uh, our bass player started hanging out with uh, a, a bad crowd. Uh, tours got canceled. Uh, we all kind of, yeah. but you know, we had money from the the too high to die thing. Oh oh yeah, and then let's not forget the uh, the uh, the Nirvana unplugged thing, which is the only record we ever made that made any money. Oh, can you talk about that a little bit? I wasn't there. Um, yeah, that's, I was curious about that, but I know that you had um, you'd played with Nirvana in the past. Like you guys had opened for that Halloween show, and like you had had some. Yeah, we um, did three shows with them right before they had to go for Unplugged, and they were basically like, you know, cycling in bands that they liked to open for them, and we got lucky enough to do it right then. That's cool. And um, you know, Kurt was able to like Kurt Kurt Cobain was like, teach me these songs, and. Eventually, and I wasn't there. I don't hang out backstage with the with the headliner. Uh, you had said you just crossed paths with yeah, Kurt one time, right? Uh, yeah, I said hello. Yeah. I said uh, hello. Thank you for having us on the tour, and goodbye. Thank you for having us. <laughs> um. So, yeah, somehow they talked them into letting them on the TV show, much to MTV's disgust. Wow. And uh, it helped us a hell of a lot. But all it ended up helping us do is get off the road and stop doing it. Yeah, because cool. we made enough money to retire. But uh, you know, ever so often they release that record, and it, it uh, you know it gives us yeah. another shot in the arm. That's nice. So wow. it's a you know it's been a it's been a cash cow. Uh, but here's the thing, mm-hmm. and this is uh, when do you guys when do you guys usually release this this stuff? How long? What's your turnaround? Um, give, give it a week. Well, here's the thing. Week. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. Okay. But. When I came back to this band and I started hanging out with them in 2017, yep. formally rejoined in 2018, <coughs> and I noticed um, there were certain aspects of the, the way the business is being run that I wanted to to uh, intercede in. Mm-hmm. And one of them was <coughs> like the uh, the records from London were like not, in, in you know, out of print. And apparently, you know, I was like after the whole... Um, after all of the various alternative bands shook out, died of, of heroin abuse or whatever they did, yeah. and they got into um, selling Spice Girls records instead. Yeah. Um, all these labels um, you know, went on a feeding frenzy, and we ended up with the situation we have today where there's like one or two major labels, and they're basically owned by uh, munitions contractors and, and alcohol companies or whatever. So you know, our record label got bought and then bought again or whatever, yeah. and Kurt wound up having to buy his way out of that contract because they like wouldn't release me puppets material damn didn't give a damn and wouldn't release the band so i think kurt had to give them points or somehow i had to buy his way out of the contract so he could end up doing a record with the fucking um hootie and the blowfish guy which is also out of print Hmm. um eventually they uh he managed to you know reform the band um, I had gotten a job and gotten married and didn't want to get involved. I was reasonably, uh, felt reasonably burned by working on the major labels and obviously the fallout from uh, Chris's drug abuse and he was still in the wind. So I was um, 
in 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 a multi-decade self-care mode. Mm, yeah. But eventually uh, that changed. I got back into it, and uh, I'm really really glad. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's the it, the band has never been better. Yeah. Uh, I got to see you guys do a Halloween show, and I think it was 2019, two years ago. Yeah, you guys we, had a tour we were in 2019. Awesome. Tight. Like yeah, it was a awesome. great show. It was a great show. And you know we're playing like our lives depended on it. At least I am. It was really good. It's and good. I've gotten a lot better. My ears better. My chops are better. My health is better. Um, Did you notice any lag? I mean, obviously it's like you guys had a, a large hiatus. Was it just like? Riding a bike, but getting right back at it, or, or was it kind of awkward at first getting back into live shows with the guys? Well, um, there's something non-musical about what we do, and as soon as I started playing with those guys, and we did like a, a, a run through the night before we first played, which was for the um, the uh, Hall of Fame here in town. Yeah, and and you thought that was just gonna be like a one-off, right? Well, it was a one-off. Yeah, they had their own uh, their own uh, drummer, and. Uh, but the thing is, is like, it's one thing to rehearse and go, yeah, we can play this one. This one's a little shaky. We'll, you know, here are the songs we know we can do. That's fine. Mm-hmm. And then um, the night of the show, somebody hands me like one of these little gizmos, one of these um, electronic pens. And I'm just trying to be a good sport. I don't get high anymore. And uh, apparently the, uh, the the quality of the weed has gone way up. And uh, I just kind of, you know, looked at it and I was like, the walls were swimming. Wow. And I was like, how do I know when it's time to go on stage? I've forgotten how this works. Is somebody going to tell us? Where's the other guys? And then we get up on stage, and I'm just fucking baked. I was like, oh, shit, I blew it, you know. And uh, what I found was the combination of Chris, Kurt, me, and you made it a undeniable combination and it was like I felt like I was sitting in the audience with you guys That's yeah. awesome. um, watching myself play and when it was when like, that high on stage is it just like muscle memory it's just like well it's, it was it was non-physical okay. there was right. a connection that um, I don't know uh, back when I was in high school we used to read the Carlos Castaneda books about taking peyote okay. and uh, he used to talk about how um, there was this line of energy that ran through your belly button that you actually that was how you actually traversed the the non-physical world or whatever and it was just like that i was like oh shit i really missed this (laughs) i i this this um aspect of existence is something that uh, i went home and just cried i was just (laughs) like this was was way more than i thought it was it was going to be way bigger way bigger deal for me than i thought it was and um I just, you know, minded my P's and Q's, and uh, I figured, well, this is, if this is meant to happen, it's meant to happen, well, and sure great. enough, Kurt called me and says, like, yeah, Shandon moved to Europe, you want to rejoin yeah. the band? I'm like, fuck yeah! <laughs> how, soon, how soon after that like reunion eight show? Eight months. Okay, eight so months. fairly, you know, within a year, pretty nice. quick. And so, That's um, awesome. And so it was just like, um, I'm not, I'm not going to pull back here. I'm like going, this is going to be, I'm doing this for these reasons. Yeah. I'm doing this to fucking make, make, the, my life the best life I can possibly have it so when I'm on stage I need it to be right and that doesn't mean note perfect yeah that means right up here mm-hmm. and here and it's like I don't know what music is like anymore but it's you know it seems like um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, what I hear anymore yeah there's a lot of shit and um, I'm you know that's on me I take mm-hmm. I take ownership of that but I like what I do and I'm real glad to be able to 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 make it, and, and I, like I said, you know, I, I, the mo- the, usually the fans that that we come in contact with are kind of annoying. So I'll like, I don't have a roadie, so at the end of the night, I got to break down my gear and haul it to the to the to the car, yeah. mm-hmm. and I'll be goddamn. It, it's, it's two in the morning, yeah. and I don't stay up till two in the morning on a regular occasions, and I'm loading my my shit out, and it's threatening to rain, and there's like. We're in the shitty part of town because, after all, it's the meat puppets. And there's creeps all around, yeah. and I'll be goddamned if there aren't these fuckers who've got the entire uh, catalog of the man. Like, could you stop what you're doing right now and sign every single copy that I have? You're like, like carrying a bass yeah, drum. Like, hey, how about this? <laughs> Fuck off. There's <laughs> like no backstage. We're stuck on the street, and yeah. the fans are like, you know, trying to like get their uh, like the back of Crescent. It's like an alley. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm just like. An alley. The 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 the, uh, the insanity that we can bring out of our fans is definitely honorable, and yeah. I, I want you all to go insane. 
but not on me. Yeah. <laughs> go out there. Go go insane on that stuff. And, you know, people are yeah. definitely tripped out when we come off stage. We come right off stage, we're doing that. Yeah. yeah. And people are like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, our part's done. Now it's your part. Go yeah. away. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. Especially when you're tired, too, after a show. No, when I'm like, fucking, my, when I'm trying to remember, <clears throat> remember that I'm human. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the last thing you want to do is deal with that. Well, you know, you get that out there. And then you come off stage and you're like, all right, shit. I got all of my equipment is sitting here unoccupied. There's a bunch of fuck holes I don't know around. Any one of them could have a gun. Yeah. And yeah. I need to like get my shit together fast. Yeah, it's a strange yeah. situation. So I, what I don't <clears throat> do is immediately go out and start hanging out with the, the audience. I like, all right, where's my stuff? Yeah. You know, who's the guy where's in the my band wallet? Who's, who's most opposite to you in terms of personality who would do like, that kind of stuff, like the hangouts, because you said you don't really do hangouts backstage and anything like that. Oh, they all hang out. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, none of them don't hang out except for me. <laughs> um, you know, Kurt likes to hang out. Elmo, he, he's very gregarious, but he's more like me in that when people come up to him after the show, they're taking their lives into their own hands. Yeah, gotcha. but um, Kurt is usually um, very accommodating. He's a very friendly fellow. Were you always like that, or was did you kind of become more reserved as time went on because people were annoying you? Like after shows, well, I'm I'm only I'm I'm only giving you an example. I'm not annoyed at you guys right now. Oh, no, no, saying. of course not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just saying. Um, uh, we, the, the 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 point I'm trying to make is that um, when we blow people's minds, um, the the shit explodes and yeah. and the the anarchy prevails, and that's a great thing. Yeah. But you know, when we're all on our own. It, it requires a certain level of personal responsibility. For sure. And I take responsibility for my <clears throat> piece of the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, that basically means living in the moment and taking care of business as it's you see fit. So it's that's what I find so interesting about making music in public for people is that the people are, like, really in, integral to the process. Mm -hmm. But um, to me... There's got to be a friction there. There's, it, it can't just be a situation where um, it's non-confrontational. It has to be confrontational on a certain level. I'm not just here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm like, you came here to see the band, and now you're going to have to smell a little bit of my doo-doo because that's <laughs> part of the, the, the cost. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I want people to understand. I mean, they, they look to the band. They look to their artists in the world, and um, there's a level of non -const non constructed constructiveness that must be addressed or not. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's just interesting to me because you know I come off stage and I'm just like full of myself, and I find all the other people are full of themselves too, and we're all like full of them each other together. But um, they sometimes want to give gifts and genuflect and get autographs and I'm like going it's all about the fucking music yeah. it's like um, you know I want to see you guys pounding your head against the wall during the jams yeah. so it's it's just it's, it, it goes beyond words which gets back to why I'm so glad I'm doing this because it's given me obviously I like to talk and I just hope that I'm not as sloppy a talker as I am a drum player but uh, I'm really glad you like to talk. It's kind of inappropriate. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it was, what was it? Um, Martin Mull said, talk, called it dancing about architecture, which is like rock criticism mm, or okay. whatever. So <clears throat> there's, there's an aspect of the music that doesn't translate into anything except for exactly what it is. Yeah. And it's some music is just there to make other people money, right? Um, and some of them, and then the, you know, this is why after this long, we've actually found a loser that can actually hang with us. Ron, our keyboard player, Ron Stabinski, um, he's like a free jazz classical guy who understands implicitly how fucked up it can be. And uh, he's an, an amazing character, and it's amazing, to, uh, it's amazing to have somebody that Kurt can play off of. Because the thing is, is uh, when it's trio, when it's power trio like that, Kurt has to do way too much work. <laughs> yeah. And now he's got a keyboard <coughs> player and a second guitarist, and we're taking advantage <coughs> of the, the five-piece to, like, make this hellacious, you know, you know, it's kind of like um, 
Tom Petty on PCP or something. <laughs> it's wow. just uh, very... When it's a power trio, was Kurt super reliant on pedals and stuff? Oh, well, Kurt was super reliant on Kurt, and that's too much to ask for any one man. Yeah. So, I mean, he did he did his thing the way he did it, but uh, he was definitely... You watch uh, videos of him playing back in, like, 1990 and stuff, and he was all about playing rhythm and lead simultaneously, the poor guy. That's crazy. And singing. So he's a very adept uh, guitarist and... Uh, you know, one of the one of the best is that his hand hand motion saying wrap it up guys. No. <laughs> no, you're right, man. Um, <clears throat> no, so we're good. We're good. So anyway, <clears throat> um, they got me back into it. Um, Kurt gave me a call and he's like, um, yeah, we did this. This we were working on this record with Shandon, and um, he's gone, and we want to like, you know, redo it. I'm like, mm -hmm. cool. Well, send me the demos. And he goes, well, I'm not going to send you the demos. I'm going to send you. The actual tracks is what we're going to do oh, is wipe Shandon off of the tracks and record you on <laughs> instead. You like, what? <laughs> Back into it. So it was like, it was click track. So yeah. I could, I was able to take it home and uh, rehearse it. I, I worked on it for like six weeks, composing the parts on my own, yeah. rehearsing a little bit with uh, with Chris and Elmo because we're the only two that lives uh, live close to each other. The mm -hmm. other guys are in other states. So uh, I was actually recording my parts after the rest of the band just right. to click track which is nice because i felt good and prepared and uh, was able to mm -hmm. like make damn sure that the vibe that i wanted was on there that's good and it was real nice because i got into the studio and was well enough prepared to actually not screw up and didn't actually make them feel like oh this is my work yeah and uh dusty notes is like one of our best records ever it's, it's one of my favorites that's awesome did you feel in your time when you were like focused on your family and, and you kind of, you know, weren't involved with the meat puppets for a while, did you really feel like something was missing, or did you really not realize it until well, there you, was you had something. That moment? There was something missing when I was in the meat puppets, and so I was doing all of those things once I left the band. Yeah, you know, the personal life stuff, having money. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. it was nice, you know. Yeah, um, you know, working, learning to pay your own way. You know, you're in a drummer and drummer in a band, and you kind of feel like you're the the, the third wheel <laughs> and it's just like to like you know you know take my own personal responsibility get a job make money get married do all the things and, uh, and then come back feeling uh, more um, more more whole as a That's person yeah. and be able to um, can feel like I have a <clears throat> make a better contribution yeah <clears throat> which comes right back to um, what I was saying before uh, you know, like wanting to like tighten up some of the the shit that were, that I felt like I could have contributed to. So like, uh, big was like, why the fuck are these records not yeah. released? Frustrating. And there, the band's manager's like, yeah, that label got bought three times over. They don't return my calls. We don't have any into them, and we don't know anything. Well, well, that kind of sucks. Yeah. And uh, eventually, well, it turns out our current label, Megaforce. Um, they want to reissue the, the back catalog the, that we own, SST Records. And I'm like, wait a minute. You guys work with Sony, and you do a lot of licensing deals. Don't you know anybody at Universal? Yeah. And she's like, oh, sure. They're a real pain to deal with, but we have, we got it done. Oh, wow. And um, so next thing you know, they're calling our manager back. And they're like, oh, those records aren't available? Oh, that's no good. That's a shame. I'm like, yeah, yeah you, sure is. You think? <laughs> Um, anyway, um, nobody, you know, band's always the last to know, but yeah. I signed up to like, you know, you, if you went on the streaming services, you can claim a band and then you can, um, monkey with their, you know, their little portal page or whatever. So I signed up to Spotify for artists, um, Apple music for artists, whatever. And I get an email from Spotify last week going, yeah, you got a record coming out. I'll be, I'll be goddamn. So, um, Forbidden Places and, uh. Um, no joke are going to be available on streaming starting uh, a week from yesterday. Great, right? cool. So by the time this comes out, it will already happen. So Go don't check tell it out, anybody. guys. Yeah, <laughs> check it out, yeah. Um, That's yeah, crazy I'm, how that works. Of course, it's not good enough for our fans because they'd be like, "Well, I want it on CD. Well, I want it on vinyl. Yeah. Like, well, it's only streaming. Well, it's only it. streaming. But hey, you got the record uh, doors, the Mud, Mud Honey ex uh, Record Store Day exclusive though. That'll be nice. Yeah. And then we, you know, we did our <clears throat> our vinyl only thing last year, which yeah. was our the the second thing that the band did together, 
and a lot of times those guys will come into town and go, yeah, we're going to record. I'm like, hey, can you come by after work? <laughs> so uh, I'll you know, still come in and dub my drums on over what they're working on. So yeah. it was very leisurely um, recording, trying to get that spirit in the studio, um, especially when you got like three family members who are, uh, you know, they've got their own level of uh, intuitive drama. Yeah. And uh, so get them they work the stuff out i'll come and add my stuff leave let them uh you know have their way with it try not to intercede too much uh just make sure that the shit that i put down on the record is going to withstand anything that they could do to it mm, <laughs> and <yeah. laughs> so uh you know we haven't done a record in now since what was it, like three years Mm-hmm. And before that was five years, <clears throat> wow. and um, you know Kurt doesn't write very fast, um, and we did uh, so we did you know he'll he'll come with, a, with some song idea and then we'll flesh it out in the studio, as opposed to what we used to do in the old days was get together every fucking day and rehearse, which yeah. was awesome. Yeah. But um, you know we don't live together anymore. And, right. Uh, right. I think if I tried to rehearse every day, I'd end up with. Uh, fingers so cramped I wouldn't be able to play yeah uh, uh, so you prefer the act of sort of just coming to the studio and sort of working leisurely in the studio or do you like rehearsing and then coming knowing exactly what you're going to do uh I like knowing what I'm going to do okay uh because if I don't know what I'm going to do I'm going to listen to the track and I'm going to lay down a very simple beat and it's just going to be you know this it is what it is right I'm, I'm not going to try to get fancy with something I don't know I might have to have somebody cue me as to when the breaks are i can't read music so it's um it's it's tricky trying to play something you don't know in the studio yeah. but on the other hand if you can't rely on your personal moxie you know to like pu- pull it over then you know what the fuck so i, I feel like i can get my thing regardless right. you know one way or the other cool but um you know we did the dusty notes thing and um you know, each song had its own kind of vibe, and then we take it out on the road, and it starts to become something else entirely. Yeah. And, um, you know, the band toured. We did like, th- you know, three different hunks of tour. We did a little West Coast tour, a little um, <coughs> East Coast tour, and then we went to Europe. And um, by the time we uh, got to Europe, a lot of the stuff that we were doing was changing a lot, and uh, they, everything gets its own live. Um, um, arrangement and mm-hmm. stuff, but even <coughs> still, um, it doesn't translate into the studio per se because what you're going by is you know the arch of an eyebrow, the shake of a of a hip, a frown, a smile, the audience, um, the vibe or whatever, and um, so there's no real point in trying to you know make the the studio ses- sessions anything but what they are and let the live things be what they are, but. Uh, we did get one good multi-track recording <coughs> while we were in uh, Europe in 2019, and I've been working to try to get some of that released on vinyl, and hopefully that'll happen sometime either this year or the late uh, or early next year. And the beauty thing about that, of course, is it only focuses on our live vibe Great. and the extended um, passages that we worked out on stage which are jammy. Yeah. And you'd think that the Meat Puppets would be more popular on the jam band circuit, mm-hmm. but we're too rowdy for that. <laughs> 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 and uh, we're just too noisy, not to mention the fact that it's kind of oil and water personality-wise, it seems. Right. Uh, you'd, you'd think that we that Fish would love to open for us, but they just aren't returning our calls. Uh, either way, um, you know, I... I, I the live vibe is so different from the studio vibe. And the, the, the idea behind the record is to try to bring the songs out, you know, to, to, to make Kurt shine as a singer, a guitarist, and as a songwriter. And whereas the live thing is definitely about uh, the magic that happens when the three of us, uh, you know, in between the three of us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's different. That's great. <clears throat> Do you have a favorite uh, foreign country to tour? Uh, well, I like Scotland a lot, but I've never toured there. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Um, I like Germany. Um, um, I, we toured once in Italy back in like the '90s, and it was trippy. And yeah. the the, uh, the deal with like the promoters there was real interesting. They they, w- they took us to like 
these exotic meals and they treated us, you know, real, we go after, we'd go after the show, we'd go to like the kitchen of a closed uh, restaurant and they would make us food wow. nice. and it was just super cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but you know, and I'll, they like it when they, they, they did anyway, they liked it when the band, uh, when bands would come into Italy because it's a little off the beaten path. So people don't, and there's a great bootleg of us in um, Rimini uh, from like 1992 or something like that. It's tremendous. Uh, yeah. Tremendous uh, rock. That's so, awesome. uh, but as far as uh, favorite countries, um, it's tough to tour over there because you usually you've got a driver. You're stuck in these weird freaking vans. Yeah. And um, the, 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 the distances are so wide. And if you have to cross the, the, the English Channel, you got to <laughs> go, get up at God hell in the morning. And here's the funny thing about, uh, about uh, Europe. Um, unlike uh, the United States, they actually have laws that try to protect their people. <laughs> and one of the laws they have is they actually don't want... Uh, if you want to drive a diesel van into town, you have to have a, a permit. Mm. They don't want a lot of pollution in their towns. Yeah. So we yeah. go to Germany. I heard Germany is very, very eco-friendly. Yeah, so we, we drive our van yeah. into Germany, mm. and the the, uh, the the gal who's running the club is like, you cannot keep your van here. You will have to drive it out of town. But we have a place where you can go. And and, and we're like, well, that's cool. He could just, um, our, our driver can drive to this parking lot outside of town, and they cop, cop a nap because we're going to have to drive overnight. And she's like, oh, no, you will not be allowed to stay in the van. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I love you guys. <laughs> this country is great. That's great. Yeah, that's nice. And then the other thing they have in Germany, which is the damnedest thing, uh, you have to pay to pee over there. <laughs> really? You go, over, you, you go to a truck stop or whatever, and you entirely have to take some of their funny little cash and stick it into a slot if you want to piss. Huh. Wow. But don't worry, there's plenty of trees. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, different story if you got to sit down, right? <laughs> well, strange. you know, yeah. you don't eat very well up there, so usually you're just you're good. You're, you're good you're to go. Good. But uh, well, I don't. I'm, I'm a vegan, so uh, it's tough to find to find the food. Uh, but in generally, you know, European situation is very different from here. Yeah. Uh, since the, uh, the a lot of the the clubs <clears throat> get certain subsidies because not only do they care about their their uh, their ecology. They also care about the arts. Yeah. yeah. So like we can go and tour in Europe. Well, we're, we're actually waiting. So we have a, a tour booked. We're waiting to see if it's gonna go because, you know, not all of the clubs are necessarily gonna survive. And mm -hmm. That's a whole right, other thing. Right. It's like yeah. trying to find a, a route. There's already huge pockets of the United States that we just can't afford to play in. Yeah. And you know, back in the day when we were young, you know, we would like sleep under the van on the side of the road and go and play in on um, <coughs> Bloomington, Il Indiana or something like that for nothing. But we can't do that anymore. So we'll do yeah. like a West Coast day, which involves hellacious, awful drives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, San Francisco one night and L.A. the next. And um, and then our East Coast stuff. But you can't hardly get into the center of the country. We can do festivals. You yeah. Know? We, yeah. We can do something in Chicago. We did something in uh, around the Memphis area. Cool. But trying to like route something that would actually uh, pay for a band and also not kill us gotcha. <laughs> um, is almost impossible. But in Europe, Dang. there's more clubs there's, yeah. and there's a, there's a bigger festival thing. So and we love doing festivals because we love playing for big crowds. Yeah, it's awesome. And uh, you know, that, that's an, a, an awful lot of fun. So what was the last festival you guys did? Like a well, big one? we did the hardly bluegrass, hardly. Hardly barely bluegrass in San Francisco cool. in uh, the, the fall of 2019. Cool. That was awesome. Elmo got on the front cup page of the newspaper. Nice. And um, those are always a, a ton, a ton of fun. That's awesome. So well, it's uh, cool too because you can reach people that might not normally have seen you. Also, it's like such a big group of people, you know. Yeah, it's nice to do that <coughs> festival. Uh, you know, reach all that those new fans and then have to go into quarantine for a year and a half. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. we also do. Um, Stuff in Chicago, uh, we've done some in uh, one. Uh, there's one in Milwaukee that we've done. That was the first time the new band played. Was uh, we unveiled our secret uh, that I was back at right. this weird festival. It's like you know, fifty people. You know, big festival, but you know, fifty people at our show. Uh, so it's nicer to do like the big. You know, when like everybody's playing in the main stage and stuff like that, as opposed to those places where there's like seventy five stages. And, yeah. Yeah. So there's different types of festivals, and then we did this great one in uh, in Spain, and we're hoping to do another one in Barcelona mm -hmm. this fall. Nice. Uh, 
Um, and also, we are really hoping that we can do our, you know, every year the band goes to the Crescent here in Phoenix and yep. plays the day after Thanksgiving okay. and then goes to Pappy and Harriet's the next day and does those two shows Very on cool. Black Friday weekend. And we're really hoping to, to bring that back this year. That's awesome. You know, obviously none of us are wearing uh, masks here, so hopefully I don't die from dealing with you guys. <laughs> and uh, then we'll be able to do the show. Be good. But, do, you, uh, do you have stuff already like mapped out? Do you guys already have like set dates or is it all kind Well, we've got dates that we're publicizing on our Facebook page nice. uh, for Great. Europe. But we won't know until midsummer how much of that is going to stick and how yeah. much of it will fall through. Still a little bit up in the and air. We're still trying to rebook the tour that we had to cancel last year, which is us and uh, the, the the dual uh, headliners with with Mud Honey. Oh, nice! And that That'd if awesome. that happens, that won't probably won't happen until next year, um, probably mid year at this point. So we're 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 still waiting. Okay. The thing is, is like so many clubs are struggling. Um, yeah. You know, our booking agents and others were working hard last year to try to, you know, get, you know, help for the, for the, not just, you know, the oil companies or whatever, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the gig economy, Ubers and whatnot, but also actual clubs. Yeah. Cause they got hit so hard. It was, yeah. it was, it wasn't just bad for the clubs, it's bad for fans. Cause yeah. we still have people, like my wife had a bunch of tickets out there. I'm trying to get refunds. They're like, no, 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 it's just rescheduled. Sometime yeah. in in the next two decades, we'll yeah. reschedule the show. Yeah. We can't give you the money back. We don't actually have your yeah. money. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of a bitch on some of them. I had had a few that I was waiting for, and same thing. It's like, oh, well, we, we bumped it a few months, bumped it a few months. It and pissed fi- me off. Finally, it's like, can I get a refund? Like The thing about <laughs> Facebook is, is like, they have Facebook events. Yeah. And it's not the same thing as the actual event. Yep. And it's <clears> like, you know, they, they basically like, go, well, we want full access to the band's social media account so we can use you to advertise our shit. I'm like, ah, I don't like that. Yeah. And I was like, whatever, you know, book, you know, club, all right, I'm accepting your event to pro- to publicize our show. And then the show is canceled, and they never canceled the event. People oh, are like, man. Going, yay, it's still happening. Oh, and boy. And now I'm feeling <clears throat> like we're screwing the fans, and we're also sending the message that they're not, that we're not taking this pandemic yeah. seriously. Yeah. yeah. So I just went and canceled all the events myself. Good for you, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And take charge. well, clubs are not happy about it because they were like, people were like going, "Where's my money?" Yeah, right. Well. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to let people advertise on the bands. Uh, yeah, yeah. Facebook. You made the right call. I think. What well, else are you supposed to do? Well, I just I felt bad because it was like Facebook doesn't actually give you enough control mm-hmm. over Our it role, yeah. to. Uh, to really tell people what's up. And yeah. uh, so now whenever I publicize something, I'm like, oh, look, we're going to do the same thing you guys are going to do. Mm-hmm. We're going to show up the day of the show. If you have any questions about it, you need to ask the club. Yeah. We just work here. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, um, you know, asking somebody at the grocery store a, a question about the product. They don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we just work at stiffs. Perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. I um, just stock the bananas, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, it's a difficult thing and uh, trying to, I, I, I don't anticipate um, live music being back where it was. I mean, it's already been bad compared to what, mm-hmm. what it was in the eighties. Yeah. When I mean, you could basically, like I said, if you were willing to work for $25 a night and, um, you could play anywhere, but now it's just like, especially for us old folks. So very you know. true. And well, it's like I'm the only member of the band that really. I mean, I'm. I, I know how. I know what this stuff is here. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like in terms of like doing shows on the Zoom or whatever, the band can't do that. Right. They're yeah. old farts. They don't know that stuff. Uh, okay. They don't have computers. Really. And uh, some of them do. Oh, but okay. Some of them don't. And if they have them, they are uh, infected with uh, with. Uh, Viruses. <laughs> Chris did a thing with, um, did a Zoom interview with Ricky uh, Lee Jones a couple months back. Cool. And uh, the day of the thing, he's texted me going, What does this pop up mean on my computer? Oh, no. And I'm like, Just ignore it, dude. <laughs> don't touch <laughs> like, it. Don't, don't ask me to, to, to save your. To, if you got yeah. problems with, <laughs> with your computer on the, the day, like an hour and a half before the thing, you yeah. may need to cancel. So it was just like, you know. We're not we're not tech savvy enough to really uh, take advantage of. I mean, trust me. If, if I had my druthers, we would be, um, you know, we would be, you know, owning all of our own shit and doing it all. But it's like, 
we're too fucked up for that. Yeah. We've got to have <laughs> management. We've got to have a, a label. And that's one of the things that people who bitch about the records not coming out on. Like our vinyl records don't have um, download codes okay. on them. And they're like, well, why don't you have download codes? I was like, well, don't ask me. Ask the label. Yeah. The label's like, well, buy the CD. It's, it's, yeah. it's not like we're making tons of money for them. Right, right, right. So we leave the that stuff to them and we focus on... Uh, Playing music and wasting y'all's a Saturday afternoon like I'm doing today. <laughs> We're happy to have you. That's nice. Right, yeah. And it's I a really good appreciate the, the deep dive, you know. I was I was gonna ask you, um, just kinda harking back to when we were talking about Mud Honey, um, who were some of your favorite uh, co headliners to tour with in the past? Like who were some of the best ones? I didn't like any of them. You don't like any of them? <laughs> um well, you know, uh my interest in uh, other bands kind of ended by the early 80s okay uh i mean I, I loved monitor when we played with them back in like 1980 but i didn't really care for a lot of your your sst bands so much um playing with black flag was a trip because yeah, um their audiences were fucking crazy yeah and they used to spit on us and throw shit at us and um uh, we did a long tour with them in 1984 and we had like nig heist opening and us and Black Flag, and the crowds were like nuts. And Rollins was in by that time, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's nothing wrong with that. I'm not complaining. Yeah. I mean, ev every every touring musician from the beginning from the beginning of the 1900s on says two things: it's super fun, and it's a super pain in the ass. Yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is. But as far as open playing with other bands, um, Meat Puppets has always relied on the kindness of strangers, and we're always really thankful for for what the for, uh, you know, the fellowship that we get from other bands. Obviously, we did a great tour with Stone Temple Pilot when they were the number one band in the land. That's badass. Um, they had their own problems, and some of those problems leaked on to, over onto us, and um, they suffered worse than we did. Yeah. But um, Did you get to talk to Scott Lyland a lot? Me? No. Fuck no. no? <laughs> I stayed away from, uh, from the rigmarole. I used to, like, get into town and take long walks until it was time to go on. Okay. But, you know, Scott would... I remember one time... Uh, I only had one one interaction with Scott in which, uh, you know, obviously um, I like to, to talk and I run, run a mile a minute and some fucking interviewer managed to piece together some of my uh, uh, offsides to make it sound like I was trashing uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Oh, piece of shit. And they, uh, they published it and those boys were not happy. I had to go and apologize to Scott so I met him at least once, I remember. Um, but, you know, uh, that how, was how did that go? Like, was was the meeting specifically just to apologize? I just went up to him and said, "Hey, man, I'm sorry." Yeah. <laughs> you know, what else are you gonna do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what are you gonna do? It's like they 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 take us on the tour. It's a it's a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. It's helping us a lot. And then there's fucking some shithead is like trashing yeah. them on, yeah. on, and it's like it's not my attitude to trash anybody in particular. Yeah. Uh, I want to trash all of the, all of us <laughs> equally, myself yeah. included. Um, you know, this all this is only Earth after all. Fuck that. But, um, you know, uh, as far as bands that I liked playing with, uh, I never really paid that close attention to who, who we played with. Um, I don't think I know any Mud Honey songs. I've heard, I know the name of their hit, but it escapes me right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not where I, my, where I, where I live. Well, you're more yeah. focused on your own, your own brand and your own well, sound. Well, I listen to more Bing Crosby than I listen to punk rock. In for sure, for sure. Um, I really like um, uh, soul music. I really like reggae music. Um, I, I, uh, a lot of the music that's in my realm sounds like, you know, it's like Jack Hammer, Jack Hammer operators don't go home and operate a Jack Hammer on their downtime. Yeah. Right. So I don't uh, spend as much time in my own pool when I'm, when I'm off the kit. But yeah, I'm super focused on what I do and I can't seem to translate what I do into any other... I don't don't relate it to any anything else, but what what I do, I hardly even relate it to the drums. At the end of the day, yeah. to me, it's like trying to. M m it's like literally, I get back there and I'm just trying to make the shit that I have control over at this given moment right. Yeah. I'm doing that right now. I'm yeah. just trying to make things right. Yeah. And it doesn't relate to music, and it sure as fuck doesn't relate to business. Yeah. And um, it doesn't relate to other people. Um, we're not 
becoming lifelong friends here, just so you guys know. We're not? <laughs> no, we're bonding oh, on a very shallow level. Uh, <laughs> I was going to invite you over, man. Yeah, right, well, I, I, uh, Max here has invited me out. Mm. Um, mm. I'm, I'll come and hang out with his equipments anytime, as long as he's not here. No, just kidding. <laughs> See, that was one thing I wanted to ask you about, too. It seemed like you were you know, fairly knowledgeable about all this kind of stuff, and you said you use Final Cut. Yeah. Um, is that is that a pretty big part of your life, making videos and stuff? Or is no. It like a no, I do a lot. Well, I have a lot of old videotapes of okay. the band, and I've ripped that stuff. And uh, like during the, the pandemic last year, for every show that we had to cancel, mm -hmm. I released a archival Oh, video cool. Cool. that's great and called it the 2020 virtual tour that's great that's awesome and um found yeah. a lot of cool stuff on now, there can we find that on your youtube or where can oh yeah where can, okay oh, definitely cool yeah, cool definitely. i'll make sure you put links to that below too so everyone can find your stuff it's like about two dozen excerpts it's not full shows it's just excerpts of stuff that sounded pretty good and okay. uh, you know i'm not deep into into final cut i use um a uh, logic a lot more okay um like I said, I'm working on a with with some other folks on a live record. Nice. And uh, you know, done some editing with that. But, you know, leave it to the other guys who use the the actual Pro Tools, the the real the real uh, a application. Is it is it a, a recent live record from your, your the 1919 the 2019 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, stuff? Awesome, that awesome. We're awesome. Trying to get out. That'd um, be great. And uh, it's a limited edition vinyl. We'll see what happens if if it if it winds up becoming part of the canon okay uh i did that live album uh that um live from montana which i did for Ryko in 1999 mm -hmm. and i actually actually got them to bankroll a uh a uh am3 sound card for my uh God, what was what the mac did i have then i had like a 9500 from like 1998 okay and, um, and that was you guys first live album right pretty much yeah, yeah. um and I just took some some board tapes and cut them together. And phew, you listen to it now. I was like, Jesus Christ, that sounds rough. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I I don't do a lot of archiving of the band stuff. I still have boxes of old tapes and stuff like yeah. that. And they're um, you know on tape. And I still have old uh, two track tapes that I'm trying to keep from falling apart. Right. And uh, so I don't I don't really make too much of my own solo material, but I do. Uh, edit down old band stuff and put it that's out great. So. Yeah. that's great yeah so did you find the pandemic was really good obviously for that kind of stuff for the archival stuff but also just for yourself as a musician creatively did you find that time was like really nice or did you find yourself being away from the drum set a lot when you were kind of isolated home yeah um but what am i going to do like play paradiddles you know practice my fundamentals my yeah, rudiments yeah. Yeah. um i missed playing with chris chris and i played play we have been playing <laughs> bass and drums since like the mid '80s, great. when he took me aside and said, "It's time for you to learn how to play music," and uh, taught me a, a lot because I was just like playing punk rock, and he's like, "You and I need to get together so you can get a sense of what, you know, what I'm actually playing." Okay, cool. Yeah. And um, you know, Chris was real helpful to me like that, and we still play together, and we have our own kind of thing. That's cool. And uh, yeah, I definitely miss that. I also miss the exercise, and um, you know, by after five months of sitting on my ass like the rest of us, I felt fat and crappy. So I started exercising a little bit more and watching what I eat and That's uh, good. felt better. But I do IT work for a living, and a lot of that I can do remotely. So I was lucky in that I didn't lose my job. I was able to continue to contribute to my company, mm -hmm. and I worked for a, a retail company, and I felt really bad because they pulled me out of the stores I do store support. Yeah. But all these other bastards were like on the front lines, you know, the yeah. essential yeah. workers. Yeah. yeah. Getting like treated like crap by the anti maskers and the other folks out there and getting sick and, you know, a, a weird year. And I suspect we we're all feeling our own uh, form of P PTSD. Yeah. Um, but I like to stay inside and uh, stay away from other people. I'm, I'm good at that. Yeah. So, so it wasn't um, too bad in that respect. Then. What I tell people is like, uh, you know, the meat puppets were born to take a hiatus. That's yeah. something that they're real good at. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so hopefully, you know, getting back up and out of the hiatus is it will be will hopefully also be rewarding. Yeah, I really hope we'll be you know back on stage um, this year. The last show we did was at a private birthday party on New Year's Eve. It's kind of cool. Uh, you know, one one twenty. 
And it was like, you know, we had played all year, and that was like the best fucking show we'd ever yeah. fucking done. Yeah. Wow. And then we did a, a rehearsal while the five of us were all in the same town. Mm -hmm. We don't do that very often. And it pointed to like new directions that are based on what we had done. And now it's all fucking gone. You know, I haven't mm, seen those right. guys in a the year momentum and a half. stopped, yeah. And yeah. so it's just like, you know, we started rehearsing, uh, Chris and I, about a month and a half ago. And for the first four or five times, I was like, I do not remember why I'm here. I, I'm like, <laughs> don't remember not feeling it. I have to like fake it till I make it. Yeah. It took a while for me to try to remember. And as Get you back can, into that groove. And, you know, as you can see, I have a problem of being overly cerebral. And it's not what I want to bring to, to the music. Yeah. And I, I need to, like, <clears throat> part of what I do at ther for therapy is to give this a break when I get on stage and, and just play. So That's good. Yeah. I need to get on stage and get on the road, get good and fucking tired, and eat nothing but garbage for about two weeks. So I, you know, so I'm like, find my autopilot again. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll see. I like that. That's great. Find my yeah. autopilot again. I love yeah. that. The whole recap on your career was really interesting because I, w <laughs> I was going to ask you about, someone had asked you uh, what you think about the music career and what it's become. And I think you said, I think what I've always thought that it needs to die. Oh yeah. And I, I was going to ask you about that, but I think we, I totally got my answer from, yeah. it's, it sounds like the musician was never respected and now there's, it's definitely heavily monopolized. Monopoly um, is a big problem in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have, we have um, some, some big problems and uh, I'll give you another two hours if you want to talk about that. Well, I, I was wondering <laughs> if you had any uh, suggestions for young musicians who are trying to make it in any way, shape or form. Well, I, I think it's fantastic that you can get a laptop and own a studio. Um, you don't even have to pay for it if you know where to know the right places on <laughs> the internet. Um, it's never been a better time to, to uh, get creative. I, I don't know what people are listening to. Uh, I remember in like 1984, at the tail end of our career, one of the last shows we did, we played in San Francisco, and there were all these young kids around, and they couldn't wait for us to stop hmm. so that they could play their techno music. Hmm. And they kicked us out at like, you have to stop at 11 so the real show can start. And like, I love techno, you know? I think it's, it's great. I grew up listening to dub music, and I really like that kind of shit. Yeah. But it's it's hard to do well and um, a lot you know, a lot of technology has um, has made it easier, but it's also gotten in the way. Right. And um, it's it's but that's just you know, that's the way I came up. I don't know what people are into. I'm, they're not here to satisfy me. So I don't know what they should do. Um, I think everybody needs to take a butt ton more acid. <laughs> but I think a lot of these modern musicians probably do that anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of um, owning your own shit, that's that's going to make you a lot happier in the long run. Okay. Uh, I know there are plenty of people out there who are trying to make money. I understand. I got watch this uh, this Apple series, nineteen seventy one, the year that changed that music changed everything. I don't know if you heard of it. It just Maybe. basically says like in nineteen seventy one, all of your like a lot of stuff that wound up. You know, like the 60s ended. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and then it does this montage of everything that happened from like um, Ziggy Stardust to the president. One of the, It's just like an Apple commercial. It's like pretty cool. A montage of all yeah, these yeah. other artists. And it ends with Billie Eilish. Mm. And I'm like, mm. is that, is that right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> is she yeah. good? Uh, no. I, to me, it all <laughs> sounds, <laughs> it all sounds like America's got talent to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. all sounds like bad Broadway to yeah. me. Yeah. And I well, just just that pre-packaged like we're gonna make you a star sound like this. Yeah, producer shit. music. Shit. Yes, yeah. producer music. Yeah. And I don't know if that's the, the if I mean I'm not gonna take any away anybody from anybody else's effort, um, but to me uh, there are a lot of um, groups that have come in um, that are looking f to for and you know, it's, it's, it music ends up tying into identity politics in a in a big yeah. way. Yeah. And uh, the Meat Puppets are always about this. Yeah. This is a this is the the main message we have for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like fuck that shit. Yeah. You know, I'm not about groups. I'm just about me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a lot of artists are feel the same way, but the fucking society makes them about groups. Yeah. It's yeah. just like who's your influences? Your country punk. 
you guys are a part of the SST scene. I'm like, yeah. I'm not. I'm yeah. really not. Yeah, I want to ask you about that as well because, yeah, so many people have put your your psych, your punk, your country, your whatever, but you guys are just you. You really I'm, just have I'm always just done... I'm just another black yeah. guy. You know? Yeah, exactly. I don't, I, don't feel, uh, I don't feel attached to anything. And, and I think that's what's made you so good and giving well, you that I don't niche. know if we're good or not, but I'll accept that <laughs> The thing is, is, I just don't think that society is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Because it's... It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a failed an ex- experiment. Yeah. And if, if I had anything to say to the young musicians out there, and it was like, um, keep, the, the main thing that you need to know is, is like, it's going to take a couple of years before your garden is going to take. Mm-hmm. So what you want to do is make sure you live somewhere where the weeds are going to be edible because you're going to be eating weeds for the first couple of years after everything falls apart mm. and you need to find your own way to, to, yeah. s- to stay alive because yeah. this is not happening. I mean, this is so cute. You know, all of these, these equipments is that you guys have. And it's like, suddenly you can own this stuff without um, the man breathing down your neck. Yeah. But, um, we like Max breathing on our neck though. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's very the, the, uh, the electric grid's not going to last forever. So yeah. you yeah. better get all your favorite artists on tape quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Makes you know, sense. but you know, that's just an old fart talking. We all, mm. all of us, all farts always say that about what's happening. The world's coming to an end. My father is like, "Well, it's not my problem anymore. You fix it." <laughs> right. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, things are 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 great all over. Um, one one day, uh, this will. Uh, one of those the old the old saying, "This too shall pass." Yeah. Yeah. It mm. goes for the good and the bad. So as far as what young musicians should go, it's like do whatever the fuck you want. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a, a video show like you guys and you can talk somebody like me onto it, more power to you. I'm glad to be able to help you guys do the things that you want to do. It means a lot. And obviously I like to talk. Yeah. So you're it's helping perfect. me do what I like to do. Oh, yeah. And, and just and thank you for coming on. Like it's, yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's a problem for me because I can't fucking shut up. No, that's good. That's, <laughs> that's, good. Why I, that's why I have a wife to remind me that it's lunchtime. Oh, it is. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Time to head out? Yeah. All right. Well, thank uh, you so much. Thank you so much. Great, thank you guys. Appreciate okay, it. so Max, ben. ben, Emmett. Emmett. Thank you so much. Nice appreciate, appreciate it. it thank, you thank you so much. Thank you, Max. Yes, thank you so much. For doing All right, guys. Thank remain you so on much phase. for this. This is very cool. Yeah. Well, of course. And thank you for signing. I appreciate yeah. it. Let me know when it's coming out, and I'll, I'll help. Um, awesome. Thank awesome. you. Uh, uh, what do you call that? Elaborated, expanded, whatever. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll do it. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Take it easy, Derek. Thank you. You guys can, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Later, man. Thank you. Thank you. Drive safe. All right, guys, and remain unfazed. Thanks for watching.